this le lecture series on biochemical engineering and it's titled receptor ligand binding. Receptor ligand binding is something that's ubiquitous in you know uh, uh, phys physiological engineering so to say and m a large fraction of the biological process or biochemical processes that occur in a human body or uh, any kind of physiological systems are uh, resultant or uh, are resultant from receptor ligand binding. So, what is this process of receptor ligand binding that is one of the things that we will study and then we will study with respect to a one particular disease uh, which is a well known disease and it is kind of uh, very uh, uh, prevalent in India. So, and with that we will just use the disease as an example to study the receptor ligand binding, but initially we will start under try and understand the mechanism of receptor ligand binding, the kinetics of receptor ligand binding and uh, how the kinetics affects certain issues with receptor ligand binding. Then we will look at a physiological aspect or a pathophysiological aspect of it, that is some of the diseases. Uh, so, as I said that m many of the processes biochemical, much of the biochemical, many, most of the biochemical processes rather are result, are result from receptor ligand binding or in other words result uh, receptor ligand binding plays an important and in most cases a limiting role in these biochemical pathways. Having understood that we also figure out over time that we have figured out over time of the last half a century or so that many of the diseases which are genetic especially are due to the fact that there are some problems or you know inadequacies or problems or deficiencies in receptor ligand binding. So, for example, if you genetically inherit a disease from your parents or your grandparents, it could be that it is it has to do with the fact that you have inherited a gene which somehow impedes the kinetics of receptor ligand binding related to that biochemical pathway. As a result, that disease is you know manifest in you, you see what I am saying. So, uh, it is not necessarily that all diseases would be manifest because of a certain biochemical pathway, but for example, diseases like uh, high cholesterol or diabetes or things like that and many of these diseases uh, has receptor ligand binding as a part of it. So, we will uh, do first look at receptor ligand binding as a phenomena first, the mechanism first and then we will look at one particular disease which is familial hypercholesterolemia that is again a genetic disease and we will try and understand that what are the factors that lead to this genetic disease and it will it turns out that we will figure out that much of it has to do with improper receptor ligand binding and you know, receptor ligand binding that should have been the uh, that is in the way it should have been. So, having said that, so let us start the chapter essentially. So, <coughs> it is called receptor ligand binding and it is uh, you know 6, 7 lectures we will have on this will probably the longest of the chapters that we will do. So, what are receptors? You know, before we try and understand receptor ligand binding, what are receptors and what are ligands? Receptors are proteins that are present in the cell membrane and the organelles, including the nucleus. And I'll show you pictures in maybe a less than a minute of how the receptors look. So these are proteins which are present on the cell membrane and that of the organelles. And <coughs> what is the role of receptor ligand binding or receptors, so to say, is to transfer cell signal from the cell interior to the cell exterior. So, these are in a way these receptors are in a way connects between the interior of the cells to the exterior of the cell. Okay. Now, one of the things that I keep telling you know uh, probably not in this lecture, but in other classes is that there is something called an inherent wisdom of the cell. Okay. The cell itself has a self protecting mechanism just like the body itself has a self protecting mechanism or self defense system either a self defense system or a self protecting mechanism. So, you are in an environment for example, where there is low oxygen and you would be instinctively, you know instinctively you would be guided by your body to move away from that environment to an area where there is higher oxygen or where there is a fire out there. Instinctively even if you are you know if you are not thinking your body would instinctively take you away at that. So, there is a self protecting self defense mechanism of the body. Similarly, each cell is a full fledged almost like a full fledged individual because you know come to come to think of it we the cell is a building block of the body and the, the, the whole of life on earth itself started with a single cell not with a mul with multiple cells. So, come to think of it we are just a conglomerate of cells right. So, and there is a each cell has a wisdom okay is wisdom of its own which is to protect itself a number one and the first priority is to protect itself and b is to perform the function that it is supposed to perform. Okay. When it cannot perform the function that it is supposed to function, uh, function then it dies you know and in this uh, process called necrosis I think I have spoken about that sometime earlier. So, um, 
so the uh, so the process what I'm tr uh, trying to talk about is that uh, so the uh, the cell as a whole has this mechanism of self self defense and self protection okay and for that it needs to function on its own but again the cell one particular cell needs to act as a part of an organization okay that organization you can call it a tissue an organization of tissues is called organs and an organization of organs is called a human body so the cell has to function from the level of a single cell to the level of the tissues to the level of the organs to the level of the human body right so how does it communicate with the exterior it is not enough to for us for a, for a body for example you want to preserve your body and preserve your system right at the same time you need to communicate with the external world you need to communicate with your friends with your teachers with your family for different things because at the uh, uh, simultaneously we are uh, you know a self preserving system at the same time we are part of a larger larger world so there is a necessity to communicate and there is a necessity to preserve oneself the reason to communicate is is sometimes for example the hydrogen ion concentration inside the cell has grown to a level say higher than such that pH is higher than you know <coughs> 7 point is lower than 7.2 it's become more acidic than it's supposed to be something like that right so then the cell needs to communicate to the external environment to kind of balance this right the cell needs to communicate to the external environment to kind of balance this so that the pH is decreased within the cell because acidic pH is not good for the cell so these kind of communications are not not just necessary to work as a group okay for the cells it's not just necessary to work as a group but it's also necessary for the cells to preserve itself and the receptor ligand binding or receptors themselves act as a very important source of that okay so these are the sort of sort of in a quote unquote the neurological not really but the neurological connects between the cell and the outside environment okay so they are the ones who allow the cell to communicate with the outside environment and these if i go to the screen now so these are receptors that essentially proteins that are on the cell membrane it could be on the organelles also for example <coughs> why on the organelles because if this nucleus wants to connect or communicate with the cytoplasm then the receptor in that case is going to be on the surface of the nu nu nucleus sticking out of the surface of the nucleus inside, inside the cytoplasm otherwise if the cell is trying to connect with the outside environment then the receptor is going to stick out from the uh, cell membrane into the outside and I will show you a picture how it is on both sides of the membrane and the major job of this receptors are is to transfer signal between the cell surface and the cell interior or between the different parts of the cell if it is the case if it is between the nucleus and the cytoplasm then between the different parts of the cell if it is across cell membrane then it is transfer signal between the cell surface and the outside and what are these receptors these receptors are G protein type receptors ion channel receptors enzyme link receptors receptors with intrinsic enzyme activity you have read some of these you know I think the protein receptor the ion channel receptor we had discussed this in a previous course but uh, so these are uh, so all of these means are essentially to communicate between the external and the internal environment for example what the, prote uh, the protein channel or the ion, re ion channel receptor for example you know if you want to throw away a certain ion say sodium or say potassium or say hydrogen then this receptor would give that signal to the system saying that the ion channels have to be opened out and you want to throw out this particular um, particular ion so that is the function of these receptors now what about ligands so ligand could be a peptide <coughs> excuse me a protein or a hormone that binds specifically to the receptor and helps in transfer of information so it is like you know uh, uh, a mechanism where the ligand so the receptor just sticking out into the cytoplasm does not make much sense it has to bind with the ligand and uh, transfer information but look at two words which are uh, in bold over here transfer information and the other one is specifically okay so that is important so which means that it is like a lock and key mechanism so a specific receptor will bind to a specific ligand okay that that is the whole idea so there is a lock and key mechanism just like in the case of enzymes you know enzymes will bind to a particular substrate so similar kind of thing and now so what the idea of the receptor ligand binding so we talked about the receptor we talked about the ligand let us talk about the binding that follows so how does this binding occur similar very similar to the enzyme binding to a substrate so what happens is when a receptor bind a ligand binds to the receptor and I will show you a picture in a minute it produces a conformational change you know this I will not be able to show but you can sort of imagine that imagine it so uh, 
it produces the conformational change in the cytoplasmic portion of the receptor, which in turn cascades initiates a cascade of signal effects that results in functional changes in the cell. So, whenever these, so you want to transfer a signal that is your job right that is the reason we were do, you are doing this binding. Now, you have a set of ligands which will bind specifically to the receptor. Now, as soon as the receptor binds there is a con, uh, to the ligand there is a conformational change that happens in the cytoplasmic pattern part and I will show you these two parts and the cell signaling starts the process is initiated ok. And then the after this process is initiated small molecules and uh, small molecules which, which are secondary uh, uh, messengers they may be activated and enzymes may modify the protein also. I mean this is something that happened after the uh, conformational change occurs after the uh, cell signaling process starts you can have secondary uh, messengers you know. Uh, 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 in, in pulmonary system you have certain kind of uh, messengers T cells and you know different kinds of secondary messengers which are activated and you can start the process which are related to secondary uh, information passage not the primary one. So, if you look at this picture over here so this look at this. So, you have over here what we have is um, a set of uh, set of uh, ligands which are these are labeled ligands ok and these are general ligand. So, what is the difference between a label ligand and general ligand? The difference is that I have just taken here a spec I know that this receptor is going to bind to a particular kind of ligand and I label that ligand and I mix it up with other ligands or other ligands are also there automatically you know generally they are there in the system. So, I have no control over this. So, the label ligands are the ones which are specific to the particular receptor. Now, you see what is happening over here look at this picture and look at this picture. So, at the end of the binding process you see that the label ligands only and the label ligands only have bound to the receptor. The reason is specificity because they are the ones that are allowed. Also notice this receptor over here this is how receptors are always drawn by the way you know when you draw a receptor on your copy this is how you draw a cup half a cup shape, shape over here and a spring like structure at the and tail. So, and the tail is in the cytoplasm and the cup like structure is ejecting out of the cell membrane ok. And the cup like structure is such that the reason the cup like structure as I said is a lock and key mechanism. So, this receptor can ligand can come and sit over there it is fine. Now, look at this what is happening this is a nucleus the blue one out here look at what is happening in the cytoplasmic part of the cell from here to here there has been a conformational change which is denoted by this ok. So, that is the thing. So, ligand population which consists of the label ligands and unlabeled molecules. Uh, in order to quantify the amount of uh, ligand that binds and <coughs> binding produces a conformational change uh, to the cytoplasmic pro portion ok. So, the next thing that we want to do is try and quantify this in terms of the kinetics. So, what do you think could be the kinetics of uh, binding? Uh, no, it is not going to be Michaelis Menten, but similar to the enzymatic binding it is not going to be Michaelis Menten the reason being you know the steps of the pseudo st uh, the, the uh, pseudo steady state reaction uh, equation and all those steps are not exactly the same, but the equation in, in general looks like that it is the kinetics actually a lot simpler. So, let us talk about the kinetics. So, ligand is denoted by L always R receptor and C is the complex that that is formed ok. So, K 1 is the association rate constant which is the second order rate constant as you can see molar inverse times minute inverse or molar inverse times second inverse and k minus 1 is a dissociation rate constant which is minute inverse or second inverse ok. Is it right go on ok. So, these are examples of cell surface receptors. Uh, that are uh, that are there in the human body and you know some of these uh, for example, let us go through them epinephrine epinephrine is a well known neurotransmitter it is a pretty well known neurotransmitter and it it regulates hom uh, metabolic activity you know it regulates hormones and that kind of uh, nurture me metabolic activities and it is a as I tell told that there are different kinds of receptors and as you can see in the middle column it is a G protein couple receptor ok. Um, Serotonin the next one is serotonin ok. Uh, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that uh, control uh, causes the constriction of blood vessels it is a very well known have you heard of serotonin? 
serotonin dopamine you've not heard of serotonin and dopamine these are very well known uh, neurotransmitters you know for example uh, if if you know if you have if you know if you have a friend who is sub depressed or something what what do you give to, what what is the, something that you typically give to the to that friend something to eat what what kind of things to eat yes no idea no idea what do you give to a friend who who is depressed chocolates right typically that's what is given at least in the, uh, so why is that because chocolates has these uh, chemicals which uh, if you look here on the screen which um, uh, stimulates the production of serotonin and dopamine okay and these are so if any at any point of time if you're feeling sad just go buy eat eat some chocolates so that helps you know it's it's uh, uh, in terms of uh, cholesterol or whatever may not be very good but it is well known that chocolates has uh, a lot of neuro neurotransmitters in there uh, that I mean has things uh, chemicals that stimulate these neurotransmitters rather serotonin and dopamine and as a result these are uh, so it's, these are uh, produced more in your brain and goes into the bloodstream and constriction of blood vessels in the brain as a result you feel this uh, this state of happiness or joy or whatever so uh, this whole you know every every emotion that you feel is essentially a chemical reaction uh, come to think of it quite sadly so uh, so your whole expression you know when you feel good about something when you feel happy about something essentially being just the fact that serotonin and dopamine are being reduced uh, are being produced in the right quantities now if you do not have them in the right quantities you feel depressed or sad or low if you have too much of them you feel euphoric so uh, these are the chemicals you know these I, I am sure if you have been taught in the other part but these are some of the chemicals of life the serotonin and, and dopamine and all these actually are chemicals of life <coughs> so um, similarly acetylcholine is an ion channel receptor and it also is a neurotransmitter so these three uh, are the major uh, chemicals that work you know uh, uh, neurotransmitters that work in the brain so serotonin dopamine dopamine is not listed here and acetylcholine so any sort of feeling of goodness that you have at all points of time are uh, a permutation and combination or a, or a total production of these three things you know it's not God's gift to you uh, happiness is not God's gift to you it is just these three chemicals serotonin dopamine and acetylcholine working together to produce that emotion similarly other kinds of emotion are produced uh, as i said sadness is produced by uh, you know by a depletion of these uh, chemicals okay now next so these kind of form the same group epinephrine is one that uh, <coughs> stimulates hormone activity and uh, this this is also you know uh, important uh, epinephrine also kind of takes play, uh, takes part in this. So this is kind of one block you can think of. It. This is a G protein. This is a G protein design channel. But these are one block of neurotransmitters that govern a lot of emotions and a lot of feelings in the brain that you have. Cytokines is a different kind of uh, receptor. Okay, it's not this neurotransmitter group. Cytokines, I know, I'm not sure if I've talked about this, but cytokines are essentially uh, immune cells. Okay. So, uh, monocytes and uh, macrophages, these all belong to cytokines and um, did, I, uh, did I discuss uh, the effect of uh, cytokines and things like that, maybe I will, uh, in maybe, did I discuss before the effect of cytokines, how uh, I think macrophages and stuff like that. Um, I think we will do this in this course also, where I can give you a little briefing, quick little briefing, I probably have a picture out here. <coughs> I can show you the picture and yeah, I think. <coughs> so, um, this is a receptor mediated endocytosis, but similar is a process for um, just let me see, I might have a better picture. Okay, so this is a probably the best picture I have. So, uh, cytokines do not really work the exact way but this uh, endocytosis process is the same you know so uh, if you do not think of this as a cell in general but if you do not think of this as a cell if you think of this as a as a cytokine then this is exactly what happens so the cytokine will form these parts so cytokine is like say a macrophage okay will form these parts which are known as invagination okay so a part of the cytokine 
deforms itself and see you have a so deforms itself like this like a mouth chip and I'll go into the details later and forms forms this kind of thing you can see here uh, this kind of structure out here so why does it form this kind of structure because the bacteria so these are immune cells and what so with the, with the bacterial attack let's talk about so what happens when you have a bacterial attack you know for example you inhale you know you breathe you breathe in certain bacteria or you drank something which had a, a, some bacteria or something like that let's talk about the simplest case where you inhale somebody sneezed in front of you and you inhale certain bacteria now if your immune system is good then you are not necessarily going to fall sick if your immune system is not good at that point of time it's a function of time also then you might fall sick right so what happens when when the bacteria enters your body what happens is that it goes through the larynx you know you breathe it in it goes through the larynx pharynx trachea and so on and goes into the lung okay now in the lung uh, what you have is that uh, you have the um, uh, cells on on the lung and on on these cells you have around uh, seven macrophages uh, which are there on these cells now per cell per cell so it's a huge and on the alveolus actually so each alve so each alveolus actually will have seven macrophages so it's like around a couple of billion macrophages I think in the lung itself so each macrophage if I now can go to the screen so each macrophage is like a cell like this okay so what happens the bacteria comes and say the bacteria has entered your alveolus alveolus is a little sac like spa spaces inside your lung entered it and it's out here somewhere out here so then the the uh, the process starts the process is first step in the process is that the macrophages which is small in size typically increase in volume a lot okay four times five times increase in volume first thing is the increase in volume as a result the energy requirement goes up so it changes the macrophages change the state from what is known as p state p p a c p state to war state okay so the body so you <clears throat> the process starts with a, again a receptor ligand binding so there is something called t cells when there is some receptor ligand binding that goes on and they sense these bacteria that are there in the system okay so once they have sensed these bacteria that are there in the system they send some signals to the central nervous system saying that that uh, this process uh, there is a bacterial attack in the system now the back once the bacterial attack has been sensed by the brain by the central nervous system then it sends out signals to the so these are all these signals uh, work through neurotransmitters and you know essential receptor ligand binding so that is the whole job of receptor ligand binding so these signals are sent back to the lung saying that there has been attack so it's like a attack on a country for example and the country goes from the peace state to the war state so what does it do it deploys soldiers to the to the boundaries of the nation right so similarly the um, brain tells the lung that there has been an attack on the system a bacterial attack on the system or a viral attack it could be a viral attack it doesn't have to be bacterial attack on the system and we need to deploy soldiers so what do you mean by soldiers the soldiers here are the immune cells the cytokines kinds in this case in the lungs so different kind of cytokines have you have in different parts of the body so the cytokine kind that is important in the lung is called macrophages in the liver or the kidney kidney also, they also there also you have macrophages on the guts and you have other kinds of cytokines as well as i said monocytes and so on in the blood so so the uh, cytokines are alerted now once the cytokines are alerted then what happens they say that uh, the brain tells the cytokines that increase the volume because unless they are big in volume so they cannot beat the bacteria or the or the virus now when we increase the volume we need a lot of energy okay to increase not just to increase the volume but to sustain it why because an increased volume just as we read in the in the cells uh, cell growth process an increased volume will will uh, necessitate increased metabolic activity so increased metabolic activity means increased use of energy and have you ever noticed that if you have a bacterial attack even before you have a fever or anything you start to feel very weak right or a viral attack in either of these two attacks even before you got a fever you start to feel very weak why do you feel weak because your energy is now being diverted to your immune system okay so your immune system is being pumped up while the rest of the body kind of takes a setback so the doctor tells that you know eat well if you if you have fever that eat well you know eat enough glucose or stuff like that drink enough water especially water that <coughs> has carbohydrates in it or you know uh, the uh, you know, these kind of um, is saturated with uh, glucose or some some kind of uh, uh, carbohydrates or other so uh, 
so you do that so that you provide metabolism metabol metabolism to the uh, cytokines now the cytokines then expand in volume then let us now go back to the state so once it expands in volume you form this invagination why do, does it form these invaginations because it wants to engulf the bacteria okay so the bacteria so around the place where the bacteria is there it forms these things and if you have seven for example one alveolus will have seven macrophages or seven these or these macrophages will form invaginations and one macrophage can form mul multiple invaginations okay it forms these and it waits for the bacteria it is like you know trying uh, putting a fly on and waiting for the fish okay so it waits for the bacteria or the virus to come here and as soon as it comes here it entraps it it entraps it like this and then it forms and then it joins its both you know both it is like a mouth of the uh, macrophage it, it kind of eats the bacteria up closes its mouth, mouth and this is what is formed you see here this, this is the, where the arrow is this is what is formed out there okay so the, and the bacteria is entrapped now here now what what do we do you have a living bacteria inside a macrophage the macrophage cannot afford to keep that bacteria just like that out there for a long time because the bacteria might start to multiply and infect the macrophage itself so what would it do what do you think it should do hmm? yes yes so that is what it is going to do it is going to acidify why is it going to acidify because uh, essentially what it needs what do you you know when you want to kill bacteria in the drain or anywhere what do you do use either acid or phenyl or something like that essentially at the end of the day what you use is a bleaching agent okay which is what either chlorine or hydrogen peroxide a bleaching agent so the cell the macrophage also uses a bleaching agent the bleaching agent it uses is hydrogen peroxide actually and hydrogen peroxide is not there in the system so what it does it it produces hydrogen ion okay and the hydrogen ion then reacts with the water to form hydrogen peroxide okay so what happens here is that this is known as the vesicle once it is kind of taken in and then it <coughs> acidifies out here which is that hydrogen it pumps in hydrogen ion where does it get the hydrogen ion the hydrogen ion is present inside the cell okay so it keeps pumping in hydrogen ion and then there is you can say that yes there is going to be a depletion of hydrogen ion yes there is going to be then this other ion channels are going to open up and hydrogen ion is going to come in from outside and then it is going to pump in hydrogen ion inside these vesicles it pumps in hydrogen ion inside these vesicles it becomes acidic and the hydrogen peroxide is formed and that kills the bacteria now once it kills the bacteria it does not want to keep dead bacteria inside itself it throws it out okay and then this invagination is gone and it is ready for the next to engulf the next, next, next bacteria so this is the process you know I kind of digressed and I am supposed to teach this anyway a little later in the course so kind of digressed and went forward uh, so so this is uh, the cytokines stimulate immune selectivity and this is this is how you know how, how the immune selectivity works uh, then there is interferon this is again so these are neurotransmitters the first two and the second next two are uh, ones that stimulates immune activity so the, this is interferon is also a cytokine but it is a one that uh, interferes with the replication of viruses it is different you know it, it's, it's, it prevents the viruses from replicating in your system then you have insulin you know you are all aware of insulin it increases glucose uptake in the cells uh, and functions as a growth factor you are aware of that and then other growth factors receptors that have intrinsic uh, tyrosine kinase activity which stimulates cell division you know we studied this uh, the whole cell division and uh, the, the uh, cell growth process earlier and there are these cell uh, um, growth factors which we did not study at that point of time which are essentially receptor ligand binding which stimulate the growth process okay. Uh, by enhancing metabolism and by different other ways so what I am trying to give you is a sort of a, a landscape picture of the different types of um, cell surface receptors that are there is the one block of receptors which are neurotransmitters extremely important for the body there is another block of receptor which are immune uh, receptors uh, which have immune activity which are equally important for the body and the third kind of receptor uh, is uh, the one that stimulates growth activity so they are all equal, equally important just as you need to grow you need to protect yourself you need to feel happy also so you know all these three are important so uh, let us now go to the kinetics of receptor ligand binding and as we said that um, the receptor ligand binding is a process of uh, uh, given by the second order reaction uh, forward reaction and the first order backward reaction reversible system of L plus R giving C 
and k1 being k and k minus 1 being the forward and the backward rate constants respectively. So, if you write the equation it is simply del c and del c c del, del t c c here being the concentration of the complex times k1 cr cl minus k minus 1 cc right. Now, what is going, what is going to do is uh, in this system whenever we are doing most of this analysis we are not going to measure things in terms of concentration, but in terms of numbers because these receptors are you know isolated uh, points essentially it is not a continuous system the receptors that you, you understand what I am trying to say. So, if you are measuring a concentration in a liquid it is a continuous system whereas, receptors are isolated points on the cell and we can track the numbers of these receptors by labeling them and looking at the uh, looking at them under a microscope. So, we are not going to look at measure their concentration, but we are going to measure their numbers. So, if I go back to the screen, so you see here that NR is the number of receptors per cell, these are the terminology that we are going to use and you may note it down because this is something that we are going to use consistently. So, NR is the number of receptors per cell free receptors, NC is the number of com complexes per cell and NRT is the number of receptors per cell which is either free or bound. So, either it is in the complex form or in the free receptors form. So, NRT is essentially equals NC plus NR. Okay. So, this is written it is valid under limited conditions this equation is valid under limited conditions. Can any of you sort of intuit why you think it is valid under limited conditions? Some of the receptors are ejected. Yeah, there are several things where that are one of these is correct what you said that the other ligands can bind to the receptors. The receptors might die to the more important things actually because even if other ligands are binding I can add in NC1 plus NC2 plus NR you know still there is a way to write a balance, but the major problem is receptors are not they do not live forever. So, they die there is a recycling F, recycling that is going on and they are again created they are born also. So, those are things that have to be taken into account when we actually do this. So, but under limited conditions for simple cases we will first assume this is true and then we will look at cases where this is not true also. Now, what about the ligand? Now, the ligand typically is in the concentration form. The reason the ligand is in the concentration form is because the ligand is in liquid form. Okay. So, ligand is measured in terms of concentration whereas, the receptor is measured in terms of number. So, there has to be some conversion that we have to keep doing all the time you know. So, in experiments ligand is added in solution uh, in a ligand form at an initial concentration of Cl0 and if the ligand. So, again you can write some sort of a balance equation or some sort of a constraint equation for the ligand that if the ligand is not metabolized by the cell then either it is in solution or bound to receptors. Okay. Just like the uh, uh, receptor is either in the free form or in the bound form similarly the ligand is either in the solution form or in the bound to receptor form. Okay. So, if n equals the number of cells per unit volume and n a is the Avogadro number then n c is the number of just as we define the number of uh, complexes uh, formed uh, times n uh, over n a that will give me the concentration of the ligand in the bound form correct. Okay. And C l is the concentration of the ligand in the free from form. So, if you start with the con initial concentration of C l naught and we are assuming that ligands are not being added at any point of time after the initial time then C l naught plus C l C L naught equals C L plus N over N over N A N A times N C fine. So, now what I want to do I had my equation over here right. So, I want to replace this in the in one particular way. So, it in the in the term in terms of N say. So, let us replace this here uh, C R and C L everything in terms of N then what you get is uh, C C it turns out uh, the concentration of the complex is n over n a times n c is it correct because just divide multiply by the number of cell number of cells per unit volume divided by Avogadro number you will get concentration 
per unit <coughs> I mean moles per unit volume. So, concentration of complex and C r would be N a over a, N over N a times N r fine. So, what we do we go back here and replace these concentrations by this. So, K 1 N this will be N r t minus N c y N r t minus N c from this ok and this will be here uh, from here uh, C l naught uh, minus N a over N c C l would be C l naught minus N over N c minus k minus 1 n c right. So, equation 4 what it gives us is now I have been able to convert my entire concentration equation into a number equation fine. So, now the next uh, assumption that comes in is that n a over n c is much much less than c l naught. The reason being that you always provide ligands in excess when you do the experiments your ligands are not the limiting reactants it is typically the uh, um, re receptors that are uh, that is limiting reactant and that is also physiologically true because what has to bind typically is in excess typically you can you can always have um, you know always have uh, um, occasions or times when the ligand is not in excess but typically you know for example especially in pathophysiological conditions when there are diseases the ligand may not be in excess but typically it's a ligand that is in excess and the receptor is not in excess uh, it has a ligand that is in excess and the receptor is not in excess right. <coughs> so, if we can do that then we can simplify this from equation 4 here ok this part we can ignore and we can simplify it a little bit and uh, so n r t this also we can ignore and sorry uh, and n c you can take it into this so, uh, sorry and this n c you can take into take into here and, and this part then uh, this part this this part over here you can ignore right. <coughs> if you look here why we one of the reasons uh, mathematically it helps us to do is solve the equation itself ok. Um, because if you look here it is um, I think it still could be solved and you can try solving it because you can you still uh, use partial fractions and solve this yeah to my mind you can still solve this uh, using partial fractions you just break open the bracket and regroup them as separate. Uh, you know separate uh, fraction, uh, 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 fractions and uh, you can solve them. But uh, here for example, it is much easier and you can do an expand this is a more or less a valid assumption you can do an exponential <coughs> exponent you can get an exponential solution out of it ok uh, straight away. So, if I write my uh, equilibrium constant as k minus 1 over k 1 then this can be slightly simplified as this ok. Now, <coughs> can you look at the equation 8 over here on the screen and uh, just tell me how it how it's going to look like if I plot my and see the number of complexes that's formed with time. So, n c naught ok. So, n c naught is the initial number of complexes present in the system. Let us for the sake of simplicity assume that it is 0 you know you did not start with any complex at all. So, how is it going to look now? Yeah I mean that is as simple as that if you do not have the first part if you have the first part then there is an added added time part to that and uh, otherwise it is just uh, uh, saturating out with time you know it is exponentially gr growing and saturating out with time because the t going to very large time this has to saturate to this value in r t c l naught over k d plus c l naught fine. And if you have the initial part that is n c naught is not 0 then you have another exponent out there. So, you can draw the two exponents and then add them up with okay, the summation of the two exponents ok. I will show you the picture in a minute. So, uh, from this we come up with the con uh, concept of half time ok. The concept of half time and this just like half time in radiological decay and for the, the way it is defined is that for a given ratio of n c over n r t time required to reach its half its maximum value. So, the maximum va value for the for the complex that is going to be formed half of that when is half the half the maximum value attained ok that is my half time. So, n c max out here you can see if <coughs> if n c naught is 0 let us assume for the case of simplicity then n c max is simply this right 
so whatever at time, time going to infinity if this is not 0 then it will be nc0 plus this okay so you know your nc max so all you need to do is half of this so nc over nc max equals half okay so nc max is a well known over here should equal this is it clear why because this is nc max i can write at see if you ignore this part if nc0 is 0 you can ignore this part and nc could be written as nc max which is this thing over here times this so for half time you just need to write nc over nc max equals 1 minus exponential this uh, thing in the parenthesis curly brackets equals 0 0.5 clear so this is what we do and you can solve for your half time and you get comes out similar uh, to what you get in pretty logical decays so half time is ln2 over k minus 1 times 1 over kl0 plus kd okay now for small lag in concentration if cl0 is small uh, then t half equals um, ln2 over k minus 1 does, does it make sense you are all nodding but does it make sense it does hmm? let me go to the screen and show you this first thing first one for small huh? No, zero order for small lag in concentration t half is given as ln 2 over k minus 1 is that does it make sense yes no it does not make sense it is oxymoronic what did we start with is it is not limiting is very high <laughs> and then we can cannot assume that cl0 is very small because as soon as you make it very small it also becomes small as compared to nc the uh, concentration sorry the co concentration of the complex right so this is though it's theoretically it makes sense but it's oxymoronic in general because you cannot assume it to be first a very large concentration and then make assumptions and simplifications based on that fact is very small the second one of course makes uh, makes sense that if cl0 is very large and kd is very uh, uh, very small then this term is very high and then t half will go to zero which means that within a very short period of time uh, the half time would be reached and the nc max half of nc max would be reached within a very short period of time but that remember has to do with not just scale not very large but also kd very small okay kd being the what is kd kd is the dissociation rate constant so uh, here the back the backward over the forward rate constant okay so kd being very small means that the forward rate constant is much higher than the backward rate constant okay so which means that not just that the ligand is present is a large amount but the reaction is taking place in the forward direction very fast so these combined effects of these two facts that the ligand is present in large amount and the reaction is taking place in the forward direction much faster than in the backward direction will make my half time uh, very small it's physically meaningful okay now let me show you this plot so this is how it looks like if i had um, if my nc initial nc is 0 this is what it is you know nc not equals 0 then this is how it looks like um, so as you see kcl it depends on cl not over kd and these are various values so it saturates out to a value if i look at uh, it will saturate out to this value okay and this one nc max i can write that as nrt times nc max i can equals nrt uh, cl0 over kd plus cl0 and um, if i divide all through by say uh, cl0 i get cl0 over kd plus 1 plus cl0 over kd so that's what we are doing in the plot over here so cl0 over kd is a, a single parameter so i've been able to convert these two parameter into a single parameter system now and um, as as it changes this uh, you know it it, it 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 increases now this um, what does this remind you of now yeah this reminds us of the michaelis menten kinetic this is exactly you know the way i wrote it over here if you look uh, uh, here so cl not this is exactly looks like the michaelis menten kinetics right so so th this is it and let's yeah so i want you to why don't you write down this problem i want you to write down this problem and then I will give you another 
problem. What I want you to do is that uh, do these problems on a sheet of paper and submit it in the next class next week uh, as an assignment with your name and roll number written. This and there will be another one uh, I will give at the end of the class. So, determine the half life for binding of endothelin to endothelin 1 receptor under the following conditions. Determine the half time for binding of um, endothelin to endothelin 1 receptor under the following conditions k minus 1 equals uh, 0 0.005 minute inverse, k d equals 16 picometer um, uh, picomolar, c l naught equals 1, 10. So, these are different values, you know. So, I want you to do for these different values. Uh, 1, 10 and 100 picomolar and 1 picomolar is defined as 1 into 10 to the minus 12 molar. finished ok. <coughs> Let us go forward. Now, what the next thing that we want to do is the determination of the rate constants of the uh, receptor ligand binding. You want something? I will repeat one more time. Determine the half time for binding of endothelin to endothelin 1 receptor under the following conditions k minus 1 equals 0 0.005 minute inverse k d is 16 picomolar c l naught is 1, 10 and 100 picomolar for 3 different values 1 picomolar being 1 into 10 to the minus 12 molar. So, the next thing that we need to do is some of these constants we need to evaluate because otherwise there is no way forward. How do we evaluate these constants and then later on during the course we will try and understand how we evaluate these constants experimentally not just theoretically. So, right now let us talk about how to ex just you go do some plots and evaluate these constants. So, <coughs> my expression the kinetic equation is given like this. So, this is a case where N C naught equals 0. So, it is given as N R T C L naught over K D plus C L naught times 1 minus exponential this factor out here. Now, the kinetic parameters here are the forward and the backward rate constants k 1 and k minus 1 because you know you have the dissociation constant and the backward rate constant coming out separately. So, you have to there are two constants there is no running away from that n r t being the total number of receptors that is an unknown and <coughs> we need to perform experiments at various values of the so, one of the ways I will talk to talk I would not talk about the experimental procedure I will talk about that later in the course, but right now theoretically if you look at it you know without thinking of the experimental procedure theoretically one of the ways to perform these experiments just like as you do this is like a first order system and you know as you do in all kinds of first why is this a first order system by the way? Is this a first order system to start with? Is this a first order system or not? Yes, it is. Why is it a first order system? Equation is same, why? Because of the assumption. Why is that? Because of the assumption we made that the CL the, the ligand is present in large amount, otherwise it is a second order uh, in the forward direction. So, so when we study the kinetics of the system, it is simply as, as simple as the kinetic study of the, that we did for a first order system. So, you perform experiments at various values of the C L naught the ligand concentration and, and then as I told you as I showed you just be, be before at the beginning is that essentially how do you do that is you tag the ligands ok the ligands that you want to if they are not tagged you cannot measure you tag them with a the fluorescence you know make them fluorescent so that they will glow and you that is the way you measure them ok. So, this is a formula and if you do not think about all the details of the process which we will deal with later, you essentially are carrying out your experiment. If you look at your problem last problem, what we did was C L naught we carried out different values of uh, C L naught, we carried out the whole experiment at different values of C L naught. So, here also you carry out the experiment at different values of C L naught and you measure the uh, amount of constants and amount of complexes that is formed because these are all tags. So, these are fluorescent. So because they are tagged you can measure them in the tag form right. So, you measure N C as a function of time for different values of C L naught you start you know how much C L naught you are putting in and you measure your N C because it is tagged and you know. So, you, it will emit fluorescence C 
we measure them with time as a function of uh, time as a function of time for different values of CL0. And as I showed you last time also uh, just here that CL0 over KD is a parameter, you know you can divide the whole equation by KD. So, CL0 over KD would be a param running parameter and as you keep increasing your CL0 over KD, the slope would be changing, right. Because as you keep increasing your CL0 over KD, what does it mean? That the uh, uh, even that the reaction should proceed in the uh, forward direction more because you have increased the amount of ligand that is present and you have decreased increased the forward rate constants right so i'll just go little quickly because i need to go want to go to the problem um, so uh, so this is um, so the slope here let's let's be a little quick so if you take the log of this you know so 1 minus nc over nc max on this side uh, log of this here okay so this is my nc max by the way so, n c over n c max you can take so n c minus n c n c over n c max is 1 minus exponential of this term right which means that 1 minus n c over n c max is simply the exponential. Now, you can take log of both sides. So, you will get ln 1 minus n c over n c max equals minus k 1 1 plus c l naught over k d is that correct is that times t ok. Now, uh, at steady state you know n c equals n c max steady state means what does steady state means? infinite time yeah t going to infinity in this case this is the only steady state possible no other steady state ok. So, the slope here is simply this if I plot this 1 minus n c over n c max I know how much my n c max is going to be because I know how much ligand I gave in and <coughs> uh, so if I if I plot this 1 minus uh, n c over n c max so I, I once it attains steady state I can measure my n c max if I plot this with time then this is my slope and from the slope uh, I can so I see l naught is known right and for different values of slope I can uh, get these constants ok because so with C L naught ok now so this is this is one so you measure this slope for different values of C L naught next step is this one the plots the slope once you calculated the slope for different values of C L naught plots the slope for different values of C L naught ok and then from this you can calculate the intercept from this the intercept and the slope, slope of this you can calculate both the constants is it clear ok. So, there are two unknowns out here in the slope, but what you do is you now again plot the slope with C L naught and from the uh, from the intercept and the slope of this. So, the intercept will uh, give you just k, k minus 1 I believe and the slope will give you k 1 or something like that yeah. So, yeah slope will give you k 1 and the intercept will directly give you k minus 1. So, the, you get both the constants. So, this is one approach and the other approach very quickly let, <coughs> let me do maybe and if I need to I will come back next class. Uh, so, to obtain NRT, NRT uh, use N C max equals N NRT times C L naught K D plus uh, C L naught. Now, N C max is something that you know right and then you can back calculate and uh, find your NRT. And, uh, and this is the, the plot that you do and I will come back to this later on the plot that you do to do this. So, essentially you want to get your NRT and this will be a intercept of this is known as catch it plot this is a very important plot and I will come back to it again and again this is known as catch it plot ok uh, uh, NC over CL naught you might want to make a quick note or at least of the axis. So, the way you do it is you make a catch it plot of NC over CL naught uh, and this is receptors per cell. Uh, cell inverse that is the unit of this and over NC and scatchet plot is what kind of plot is it a steady state unsteady state what kind of plot what kind of plot is scatchet plot steady state plot right. So, essentially this is what you are plotting this box out there ok. So, N C max over C L naught though it is written I have written here N C, but it is actually N C max that you are plotting and N C max means that steady state has been attained ok. So, N C max over C L naught equals N R T over K D minus N C max over K D fine. So, so if you plot this over this then what do you get you get your intercept is this and slope is 1 over K D or minus 1 over K D. So, you can directly calculate your NRT. So, in a way as I said that if you know your K D if you like you know you already know your C L naught if you know your forward and rate backward rate constant you can know your K D. So, you can back calculate from N C max to calculate your NRT and this is the process. The reason we assume this process is because we do not need one data we want to use multiple data points to minimize error. 
So, this is the way. So, scattered plot remember most important thing to remember it is a uh, steady state plot. What you plot essentially is a steady state value of N c over C L naught versus C L naught. The intercept will give you N R T over K D, the slope will give you K 1 minus 1 over K D. Okay? So, the last thing I want you to write is this problem. So, these two problems you are going to uh, do together and submit as an assignment in the next class. So, the problem is use the following data to determine the specific binding of a ligand to a receptor. the values of KD and the number of receptors per cell. Okay. So, basically you need to find, uh, find all the rate constants and an RT and CL naught is given in molar 1 10 to the minus 10, 5 10 to the minus 10, 1 10 to the minus 9, 5 10 to the minus 9 and 1 10 to the minus 8. So, first case is when there are no unlabeled ligands there, there in the system and second case is when there are 100 excess unlabeled ligand and that is the data that is given to you. So, 100 uh, excess unlabeled ligands per cell by the way. Okay. And these are NC values that thousands are numbers that are given in thousands are the NC values you obtain. NC values are steady state or in other words NC max. So, the hint is obviously you have to use something like a scattered plot to do this because this is steady state uh, values that are given and but there are some tricks involved in it and some yeah just Okay, I hope you have all written down. So, we can stop here and we will continue in the next class. Thanks.